About five years ago, uh, a group of friends and I went to El Paso, Texas to make a record. El Paso is uh, this amazing town. It's, it's kind of surrounded by desert. And to get to the studio, you had to drive east out, kind of out into the desert. It's this amazing landscape. It's, it's gray and brown. You kind of feel like you're on another planet. There's sort of scrubby brush, but for the most part, it's just flat as can be. And then to the south, just, just across the border in New Mexico, there are these mountains that just appear out of nowhere, uh, breaking the plain. So we went to this studio, it was on the, the world's largest pecan ranch, and, and it's an amazing place. I know there's a lot of musicians here, so you'll appreciate this. It was racks and racks of amazing vintage gear, and walls of guitars and amps, and everything you could kind of could want, and it was this amazing experience to be there and to, to spend the day recording. So at the end of that first day, we, we walked outside, and, and the sun was beginning to set, and the whole desert... It turned red and it turned golden and, and again, you felt like, especially for me being from Kentucky where everything's green, you felt like you were in another planet. And we were all kind of awestruck by it as the sun was going down and we stood there and, uh, and Manny, the engineer who was running the sessions, he, he came out you know, a few minutes after us and was locking things up and he lives there. And we kind of said to him, man, does this, does this get ever, ever get old? I mean, it's so gorgeous, it's just otherworldly. And he's like, yeah, man, I, I love living here. It's great. But, you know, it has its moments where it can be pretty creepy, pretty strange. And we were like, okay, tell us about that. And he said, one morning I had this session that I had to come in for really early. They wanted to start at 8, the band, and so I had to get in here at about 5.30 in the morning to set up microphones and get everything ready. He said, around 7.30, I walked outside to smoke a cigarette. And all over this property, there are these irrigation ditches. Uh, the reason they're a, pe a pecan farm in the middle of the desert is about once a week, they flood the whole thing with, with water from the Rio Grande. And he said, I walked out, and I'm just kind of kicking around on the, on the driveway, and I see something in one of these irrigation ditches. And I'm wondering, well, what is that? And at first, I thought it was an armadillo. Sometimes armadillos will get in there, and they'll drown, and it's real gross. So I walked over to look at it, and I realized I was looking at a face. It was a human head. And then I saw another one, and another. And in total, there were seven heads in this ditch. So you can imagine our reaction. We're about to sleep in a house 100 feet away from this <laughs> ditch, you know? So we're all freaking out. And uh, my friend Jason, the drummer, kind of sarcastically goes, well, I, you know, Hopefully that's the worst story that you've experienced here. And he goes, well, actually, <laughs> he says, well, there was another session I was doing and I got out really late and uh, it was pitch dark out here and I was locking up, I was about to walk to my car and I see some eyes glowing in the darkness. And you know, there's coyotes everywhere out here and coyotes are skittish. I wasn't, I wasn't terribly afraid or whatever because if you make loud noise, you stomp your feet, the coyotes run away. So I make a loud noise, I stomp my feet, and it doesn't move. It's just staring at me. And then I realize it's starting to move towards me. And I think, well, is that a wolf? Is it a dog? And then it steps into the light, and I see that it doesn't have any hair. And I see that its spine is kind of bony. There are these ridges on its back. And I know I'm looking at El Chupacabra. <laughs> Those of you who didn't grow up watching the X-Files, El Chupacabra is this mythical beast that haunts the borderlands between the United States and Mexico. Uh, its name, as I understand it, literally means the goat sucker. And you know the El Chupacabra has come because you walk outside and you've got like a dead cow or a goat or whatever, and it's been completely drained of blood, you know? So it's sort of this vampire, lizard, zombie, dog creature. And he said, yeah, man, it chased me to my car. It was terrifying. And so you're probably wondering, why on earth am I telling this story now at this conference? And, and there's two reasons. One is, first off, I'm doing, a, I'm doing kind of a magic trick, okay? What happens when somebody tells a story is that certain parts of your brain begin to, to shut down and other parts of your brain begin to light up. See, the part of us that sort of processes rationally and that deals with propositional thinking and all of that, when you're listening to a story, all of, the, all of that begins literally to, to shut down. The energy, the, 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 the synapses and all that, they're not firing in that area of your brain. What's firing is the imagination. And what's actually firing as well is the visual part of your brain. Your brain is trying to bring this story to life. It's trying to illustrate it for you. 
The second reason is because I think these two stories are actually related in a really meaningful way. See, just to the southwest of El Paso is Juarez, Mexico, and at the time that we were down there, it was the murder capital of the world. It was controlled by drug cartels, it was the center for all kinds of drug trafficking and other things moving back and forth across the border illegally. And so in a world of horrific organized crime where, where heads show up in, dish, in ditches, there's a darkness that looms over it, a shadow looming over it. In fact, this is sort of typical of this part of the country. There's always been sort of a frontier, and the frontier's mysterious. The nights are dark. The desert feels haunted. And so to me, it makes perfect sense that in this place of darkness and mystery, that a story, like an El Chupacabra, is made. Andy Crouch said that culture is what we make of the world. And to me, El Chupacabra is a myth that gives a name to the darkness that looms over the desert. The other reason is because I want to talk a lot about stories today, because stories shape our experience of the world. They shape our feel for the world. And, and one of the examples of this is that as we were there at this, uh, at this ranch, you know, the days after that we heard these stories, we kept asking people, hey, is that true? Like, did the heads really show up? And is El Chupacabra really haunting these, these, uh, these groves? And to a person, every single person we talked to, had an El Chupacabra story. They all did. They all believed in it. Somebody had seen it or one of their friends had been encountered with it. And see, when you're immersed in a world that continually tells certain kinds of stories, it makes those stories more plausible, as absurd as they might sound, as absurd as they might seem. So I don't believe that there's a vampire zombie dog haunting the desert. But I bet that if you took me and I was working on that ranch for six months and you came back, that I'd probably be like, well, actually, because you'd hear the stories over and over again and they would, they would sneak in, they'd sneak into your imagination, they'd sneak into the way that you feel the, for the world. I also think of this story as something like an enchanted relic. There's a guy, a philosopher named Charles Taylor, who, who basically says, look, if you go back in time about 200 to, to 500 years ago in that window, the world is very different than it is now. The world was kind of enchanted. And in an enchanted world, there's, it's a world of mystery. It's a world we do, where we don't have rational explanations for everything that you experience. It's a world where humanity seems vulnerable to, to evil spirits, to blessings, to curses. To me, El Chupacabra sort of is a crack in the way that we experience the world now, which Taylor calls disenchanted, where all this mystery and all this magic has kind of disappeared. But occasionally these things continue to show up. Another enchanted relic that I love is fairy tales. There's, these are stories that, that shaped culture. They shaped the world that people were immersed in. They told fairy tales to sort of pass on wisdom and understandings of how does the world actually work. One example of this is that in Belgium, there was a, a fairy tale about literally fairies who lived in the woods that would make bread and, and give it to the poor. And, and sort of the lesson of the story is that if you didn't eat the bread when it was given to you, or if you tried to hoard it and store it up and save it, it would turn to toadstools, which were poisonous. And again, there's two interesting things about this story. One is that it shapes your feel for the world. It, it teaches, it passes on this wisdom about abundance and generosity. You can trust, it, the story is basically saying, you can trust the cosmos to take care of you. You can trust that the world is abundant. And it doesn't matter if you actually believe in fairies, there's something about that story that's true. And in particular, those of us that are believers, we can really believe that it's true. We can really believe that God is an abundant God that provides, because we're told over again that he, that he clothes the birds of the field, why won't he take care of us? Or we can go to Exodus chapter 20, when he literally does what the fairies do in this story. He gives them bread, he gives them sufficient bread for the day. And if they try to hoard it and store it up for the future because they're fearful that he's not gonna provide for them, the bread turns rotten and it's full of worms. I think in this too, we can see the difference between an enchanted world and a disenchanted world. Because this idea that, that you need to enjoy uh, what you have now and yet you can trust the universe to be abundant to you and to continue to provide for you runs against everything we've learned. The, the way these stories work, uh, the way Taylor talks about them is that they shape this thing called your social imaginary. And, and what he means by that is not imagination in terms of making things up, but in terms of the way that your mind is framing your experience. 
the way that you know the world. And, and what that results in is that you have these gut reactions to things, gut reactions that incline you to, to various things. So in an enchanted world, your gut reactions to your circumstances tend to lead you towards more mystery or the possibility of spirituality or the possibility of religion. In a disenchanted world, they lead you away from that. And these days, in particular, we aren't inclined to this kind of thinking. In disenchantment, we don't believe that we're vulnerable to, be, to, to evil spirits. In fact, we've come to believe that we can master anything in the world, that we can rationalize it, that we can anatomize it, we can break it down, we can provide explanations for the sun and the moon and the weather and, and disease and everything else that comes to it. And we think that what we know about those things is the ultimate explanation for them. We're not inclined to believe that there's anything more to the world than we can see. We're not inclined, therefore, to religion or to Christianity in particular. So why is that? Well, there's a philosopher that I love. Her name is Hannah Arendt. She's a 20th century German-Jewish philosopher. And she blames Karl Marx. <laughs> she, says, she, she says this. She says, all of Western history, really intellectual history in particular, it all goes back to Plato. And, and hold on with me for a minute here, because I know some of you are rolling your eyes, but just stick with me for a minute. I think this is fascinating. So she says, she says in particular, it comes back to Plato's cave analogy. And if you know the cave analogy, what, what that story was about is Plato said, imagine some people whose entire lives have been spent from birth shackled in a cave. And they're sitting on the floor of the cave, and they're forced in such a way that all they can do is they can look at this wall, right? And behind them, there's a fire, and there are people and movement happening, you know, at the fire. But all, they, these people can't see the fire. They can't see what's behind them. All they can see are the shadows that come from the fire that are cast along the cave walls. And Plato says, imagine what would happen if someone came along and unshackled one of these people, and he took them out to see the sun, took them out to see the trees, took them out to see the light and the creatures that, that fill our world. What Plato was trying to get at is he was saying, we spend so much of our lives focused on this material world, on the most basic needs of life, providing food, shelter, and all of these things, that we often miss out, or, or that we are missing out on the fact that there's something bigger going on. There's a transcendental reality that we need to figure out how to get in touch with. And that's the work of philosophy. And Arendt says that that shapes all of Western thought for almost 2,000 years. And then along comes Karl Marx. And Marx is famous for, obviously, for his, his communist and socialist uh, work. But he's also important because he did that kind of work because he wanted to take philosophy out of the world of the transcendent. He wanted to basically say, all that transcendent stuff, it's all garbage, it doesn't matter. We've got to focus on the basic needs of life. We've got to focus on politics and how we live together. And he, he, he banged away at the world being a materialist world and having rational explanations for every single thing that we encounter. He actually used the phrase that, that he wanted to turn philosophy upside down. And, and he wanted the real world to be understood not through these lenses of perception or you know, all this sort of gobbledygook that you get from other philosophers, but it's only the material reality. And to be fair, Marx is a man of his time. There are many others at that time that are essentially saying the same thing. People like Freud and before Marx, Hegel and people like Charles Darwin. And so there's no doubt that at this point in Western history, we begin to move a, a social imaginary that shapes us in a way where we're inclined to think about spiritual things, we're inclined to believe in transcendence. It begins to shift into a more and more disenchanted materialist way of understanding the world. What Arndt says is, she says, Marx's move was to take us back into the cave, to chain us back up, away from the light, away from the heavens, away from mystery and unseen influences in the world. And it's particularly interesting to hear Arndt say this because she basically spent her whole life trying to understand the horrors of the 20th century when she was young, she was a, a, like I said, she was a German Jew, and, and she, in 1933, escaped Germany, and then in 1939, barely escaped, uh, barely escaped being rounded up and sent to the camps and almost certain death. 
And so she spent the rest of her life trying to understand how did this happen? How did we find ourselves here? How could this kind of atrocity happen? How could it make sense? And the way she puts it is she says, this was a break in the tradition. Something broke in the tradition. And we were left with this materialist world that made these kinds of horrors possible. Because there's no ultimate justice, there's no overarching narrative, there's no call and demand for moral, for, for moral action and for ethics and for character in a world that's been drained of any kind of transcendent truth. So now we're living in the cave, we're living in a world of shadows, we're living in a world where what we see is what we get, but we still have to tell stories that make sense of history. And, and what's been happening since then, and in fact, Hegel and Marx and these other guys were saying this, they're saying, look, history is about progress. History is moving us forward in this way where human society is getting better and better and smarter and smarter and, and are, we're socially evolving and we're morally evolving and we're ethically evolving and we're going to be way better off because of all these things. And again, aren't as interested in this because the big speed bump, the glaring problem here is a place like Auschwitz, where it doesn't seem like humanity is advancing and progressing. And yet that story is powerful. Uh, the story of progress, the story of, of this movement of his, human history has totally shaped the world that we're immersed in. And it's one of the reasons we as Christians are facing incredible pressure from progressives and secularists now. One of the critiques that you often hear when Christians are standing up for a traditional ethic and a traditional sexual ethic and a traditional understanding of, of God and man and morals and all of these things is evolve, evolve already. History is passing you by. Why are you clinging to this old faith? You also hear throughout our culture that these other kinds of stories that shame us from belief. Charles Taylor calls them disciplines of disenchantment. And it's anytime somebody's accusing you of superstition or of magical, uh, magical thinking. It comes in movies, a movie like Garden State, there, where the climax of that film, I know it's an old reference, sorry. The climax of that film is basically, you've gotta face this abyss. You've gotta face this abyss of meaninglessness and then make meaning through the, through the, the life and the relationships that you have. My favorite example of this is actually Castaway, a wonderful movie, well-received, critically celebrated, and, and, and people love it. But ultimately, that movie is about how there's, there's no real narrative that's governing the world. There's just you. And so in that movie, he creates his own gods, and, and then he, he destroys his own gods. He loses them. And then he comes back to his one true love, and it's supposed to be this romantic thing where they reconcile, and she's moved on. And the movie ends with him going out into the world, a man alone, every bit is cast away as he was when he was on the island alone. It's a dark story. Now here's the thing for us as believers is that we can shout out, look, disenchantment doesn't hold up. It's not reality. It can't account for what we actually experience in, in our ordinary human lives. A disenchanted narrative, a, a story where what you see is what you get, can't account for the power of love and jealousy and our sense of darkness and death in the world. Again, Arndt was troubled by this, this radical evil that appeared that didn't seem to have an explanation in the story our culture was telling. The second reason it doesn't hold up is that it's not satisfying to our humanity. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that he has set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. In Acts chapter 17, Paul goes to the Oropagus and he's listening to poets and artists and philosophers and he's listening to them talk and he comes upon this temple to an unknown God and he says, all these things that you're longing for, all this connection to eternity, to a God, to meaning, all these things, it has a name and his name is Jesus. That's the world that we're living in right now, a world where this, this longing persists. I don't think we live in a world, uh, James K. A. Smith says, we don't live in a world that's actually the triumph of new atheism, where, where it's marked by a hatred of God. We're, marked in a, we're living in a world that's far, more, uh, far better summed up by the words of the novelist Julian Barnes, who said, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. We miss God, so we go looking for him in the material world. Novelist David Foster Wallace said, we're all dying to give ourselves away to something. And so if there's no gods for us to give ourselves away to, we still have to worship. 
And so we look for things to worship that exist within this material world, this material reality. So we worship power, we worship fame, we worship sex, we worship money, and we look for priests who can give us access to that world, like Kim Kardashian. I gotta admit, I'm kind of obsessed with Kim Kardashian because I think she so perfectly embodies the worship that exists in our culture. She's like a religious icon, a symbol of the good life. She's not famous for her talent, right? And I'm not saying she's not smart. She actually openly admits that she's not talented. She was interviewed by The Guardian a couple years back, and you can tell reading this article where, where the, the reporter's trying to get at why do you occupy this space in our culture? What is it about Kim Kardashian that has so captured people's imaginations? And she asks her point blank, blank, what's your talent? And Kim replies, well, a bear can juggle and stand on a ball, and he's talented, but he's not famous. Do you know what I mean? It's an amazing quote, y'all. <laughs> See, I think we look at someone like Kim Kardashian and we're saying, if we had what she had, we'd be happy. She's an icon of the good life, of the things that we think would satisfy us. Love, power, wealth, success, fame. And she's not the only one. She's not the only place we're looking where we think, man, if I had that, I'd be satisfied. Icons like the food porn you see on Food Network or the house porn you see on HGTV. If I had that, I'd be happy. And we're hooked. Our imaginations are hooked because the heart has to worship something. So to summarize this, we're living in this disenchanted world now where the stories that are being told in the culture around us again and again and again are saying there's no mystery to the world, there's no spiritual vulnerability in the world, there's no consequences beyond this world, there's only the here and now. There's only the life you have now. So live it the way you want. Make your own sense of meaning. Define good the way you want to define good. And the highest value of that world is authenticity. Be true to yourself. Be authentic to yourself. Pursue love. Pursue life. Pursue success in a way that fulfills your vision of your authentic, true self. And because we live in this world, because we're immersed in it like the El Chupacabra, because you hear it over and over and over again, it sneaks in. It's a story being told, and it sneaks past your rational mind and into your imagination. And suddenly, though you believe the gospel, you find yourself throughout your life finding your reactions and your instincts resisting faith, resisting belief that God is with us. So we end up haphazardly looking for meaning in the material world and we create priests and icons who embody those values for us. So what are Christians to do? How, how can we live, how can we move from the, a disenchanted feel for the world to an enchanted feel for the world where we believe that God is near and that, he, that connecting with him is possible? The first thing I want to say is I think we've got to be better critics and readers of culture. We need to understand the way that the stories culture is telling and the things that are entertaining us are actually a call to worship. A call to worship sex, a call to worship money, a call to worship fame. So often Christian criticism of culture focuses just on sex and nudity and pornography and violence and profanity, but the situation's way more complex and way more difficult than this. My favorite example of this is Extreme Makeover Home Edition, right? Where some, some, some family that's struggling, some problem that exists, um, the, the, the people come along and they get all these volunteers and they go and they work on their home for a week while they're off at Disneyland. And at the end of the week, everybody comes home and the, the dream house is built and there's this big bus blocking the way. And what happens at the end of that show? They yell... Right, and the bus moves. Good job. The bus moves, and what happens next? People fall to their knees, right? They weep. They cry. They're worshiping. They're worshiping. And what the Bible tells us about idols is that your idols will crush you. And there's a reason that that show, they don't talk about it a whole lot anymore. Because you know what happens after the show? Most of those families can't afford the upkeep and the taxes on those homes. They end up having to move out 
or declare bankruptcy. It's crazy. Look it up. Google it. It's terrifying. So the first thing is we've got to recognize the way that the stories our culture is telling us or calling us to worship. The second thing is we've got to learn to tell better stories. And a couple of, a couple of dynamics for this. The first is that we've got to be shaped by a better story. We've got to immerse ourselves in worship and liturgy and spiritual disciplines that reorient us to a Christian way of life. And what I mean by that is more than just having the right ideas in our head. We've got to have a Christian way of life. See, you are deeply spiritually disciplined, but you're disciplined in the disciplines of disenchantment. You're deeply disciplined in entertainment and all of these things that are shaping what you love and calling you to worship in a world without God, in a world without transcendence. And if we don't change the way we live, we're not going to reshape and rebuild our hearts. We've got to learn to pray and teach our children to pray. We've got to learn to meditate and immerse ourselves in Scripture, not just consume the content, not just pass the quiz, but see ourselves living in that world where God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path and he clothes us better than the sparrows and we can trust him. We've got to learn to fast and feast and understand the way that God blesses us and the way that God calls us to lament the brokenness of the world. We've got to learn to celebrate life's gifts like children and marriage and great moments like baptism and Lord's Supper and what they represent. We've got to get comfortable with habits like silence and solitude and secrecy, which teach us to withdraw from people and to be alone and intimate with God. And most of us are terrified of our solitude. We need to be immersed in the story of the gospel by gathering with the church and remembering and renewing our covenant. In other words, we've got to tell that story to ourselves in every way that we can and in every corner of our lives. And then as artists... As people who are creative, we've got to learn to tell better stories as well. This comes second, though. We've got to change our habits of life. We've got to change the way that we're living before we try to, to step into our creative work. I'm not saying stop it, but I'm saying if you want to make art that's truly shaped by a Christian worldview, live a disciplined Christian life. Reorient your life around the kingdom of God. And Christian art is not necessarily about cramming a worldview into our art or cramming doctrine into our art but letting our art flow from who we are, transformed people with Christ living in us. And it's not necessarily overtly Christian art that God may be calling you to, though it totally may be, and I have no problem with that. I thank God for people like Shai Lin who are using his gifts to catechize the church and to teach. But I also believe that there needs to be art coming from the church out into the world whose way of seeing and knowing the world causes cracks in the disenchanted way of thinking that surrounds us. Art like people like T.S. Eliot and Flannery O'Connor and Madeline Langle and Lucy Shaw and Walker Percy and Wendell Berry and, of course, Tolkien and Lewis. You always have to mention them. And, and a guy like Brett Lott, who you're going to hear from in a minute. Brett's this brilliant novelist. He's been working for decades as a novelist. And his, his Christ-transformed heart shows up in his stories that he tells in subtle and beautiful ways. In other words, we need to be artists who bear witness to the reality that we're living in a world that is more than what we can see, where there's a king and a kingdom who's transforming the things around us. We've got to be the best artist that we can, make the best work that we can, and leave the results in the hands of God. And these two things work together. Immerse yourself in the story of God's kingdom and his world, and then tell stories as a result of it. The results, I believe, are that we have this opportunity to disturb and disrupt disenchantment. We can unmask idolatry in the world around us. We can do what Cormac McCarthy hints at in several of his novels with this phrase where he says, we carry the fire. His novels are incredibly dark, and there are these hopeful characters that show up in the midst of it in several different novels who all say the same thing, we carry the fire. See, I think when El Chupacabra shows up in the world, when, when El Chupacabra shows up in the world, it shows us that this disenchanted way of seeing doesn't quite hold up because we've got to have a name for the darkness. We've got to understand that there's something bigger in the shadows, whether it's the cartels or Auschwitz. Evil needs a name, and it's mysterious, and it's bigger than what we can see. It needs a backdrop with a greater sense of darkness. And I believe that by comprehending how deep, oppressive, and powerful the darkness is, 
We can tell a story of the light that shines and the darkness and the promise that the darkness will not overcome it. Thank you. Thank you.